Okay, welcome back everyone. In the last session, we covered a really high level overview of what we wanted to achieve and some of the goals that we had for learning Rust, but also applying that to an astronomy problem, which was to parse and process FITS files, which is a very common astronomy data format. Today, we're really gonna get started with Rust though. Uh, and we're going to cover two command line tools in particular. The first of those is Cargo. Uh, well, actually we're gonna cover Rust up first. Uh, and how that tool lets us bootstrap our compiler and our, uh, our tool chain. In fact, we can have different tool chains installed at the same time and we'll cover how you do that with Rust up. We'll also cover Cargo. So Cargo, as I mentioned in the last session, was uh, is a Rust package manager. Uh, it's a lot more powerful than just a package manager though. It lets you run unit tests and benchmark your code. It allows you to manage all your dependencies, uh, build crates and repackage those and publish those. Uh, it's quite a powerful tool, so we'll cover that. And then we'll, finally we'll get started writing some very simple code. We probably won't get into writing FITS specific code today. We'll see how we go. That might be for the next session. So for those of you that haven't played with Rust before, I'd encourage you to go and just Google Rust up. Rust up is the preferred way of getting started with uh, Rust on your operating system and your platform. So this will quickly take you to rustup.rs. You can see here that the website has determined that I'm a Windows user. Uh, just so that everybody understands, a lot of the stuff that I'll be doing in this series is gonna be on Windows 10, which is what I have installed on my desktop PC at home. I use Linux a lot at work and I also have OS 10 installed on all my laptops. So I actually use those three operating systems quite a bit. I'm probably a little bit more familiar with Linux and OS 10 if I'm honest, but Hey, it's good to be across all operating systems. And so anyway, in this case, it's determined that I need to go and download rustup-exe, um, sorry, rustup-init.exe, and that will basically run the Rust Windows installer and, and get everything up and running for me. So I've actually already gone and done that. Uh, so if we go back to my environment, uh, I can actually start looking at where Rustup is. So you can see here that it's installed Rust up into my home directory, into a .cargo folder or directory inside of home, and then slash bin. And in fact, that's where uh, the Rust compiler is as well, uh, and um, a whole bunch of other things that we will care about. So this is a really common place to look on OS 10 or Linux. Just look in home.cargo, and you'll see probably a slash bin directory there once you've installed everything. So I'm not gonna go through and install this. That's pretty easy for people to do. But what we'll do is just have a look at what Rustup gives us. So let's have a look at the online help. So we can see here that Rustup has a number of subcommands. The ones that we're gonna probably spend most time talking about are update and default. There are some other things here that I don't really know much about. I don't tend to play with that much, but you're more than welcome to go and have a look at that stuff. Uh, update is interesting. Update lets you update the Rustup tool itself, but it also updates all of the tool chains, the Rust tool chains that you have uh, configured and installed on your environment. So if I were to do that right now, if I do Rust update, it will see that uh, there is a, a nightly update that uh, that is available and for some reason that failed. I'm not gonna try and debug that right now. Uh, but what I can also do is, uh, we'll go back to our online help for Rust up. What I can also do is use Rustup to change my default tool chain. So I'm gonna go and look at what that is currently. So if I just type Rustup default, it'll tell me that my default tool chain is called stable, and then obviously the, uh, the architecture for my, my platform and the operating system and so on. And this is, this is my default tool chain. What I can do though is, if I, if I look at Rustup uh, default dash dash help, what I can see is that I can pass what's called a tool chain and these can have different names. So I can have stable, nightly, and I can even have a specific version of Rust. In this case, the example was 1.8.0. So the default that you'll be using and will be using throughout this series is stable. This is a, a version of, of Rust that the Rust community release every six weeks. They do a really careful job of making sure that they don't practice you know, break backwards compatibility with previous versions of the Rust uh, tool chain or the stable tool chain. Uh, and that's why they release it every six weeks. And so this is a fairly 
a good way to get uh, good updates and security updates and performance improvements, uh, but, stay, but stay stable. However, you may choose to change to nightly. And so uh, I'll explain what nightly is, but let's go to rust up and we'll change that by going rust up default nightly. You can see here that it's changed to uh, the, the nightly tool chain. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you wanted to go back and compare it to the previous version, uh, it's actually running a different version of, of the compiler as well. Uh, so if we were to look at that, Rust C, which is the Rust compiler dash dash version, we can see here that it's 1.40.0 dash nightly. Now what nightly does is it sort of packages and, it, and it, it's built every day, so as the name suggests, it's built every, every night. What it does is package sort of bleeding edge features that the compiler teams uh, the Rust compiler teams are building into the language. And so you don't tend to need those unless you're taking advantage of some more advanced features that maybe aren't in, you know, isn't, isn't part of the stable or the, the core language yet. Uh, and then what, what the, uh, the, the compiler teams do is they, they play with these new features. They do caveat it and say that it could break your, your code. They don't guarantee that what works on stable will always work on nightly. Uh, there'll be breaking changes that they're testing in there. But if you do want to play with some of the bleeding edge features, you can always go and change to nightly and, and do that. We're not going to do that though. We're going to go back to uh, stable. Now, if I look at what the what version of the Rust compiler I have here, uh, 1.38.0, so a previous version, you can see it was built on the 23rd of September. So that's just uh, less than a couple of weeks ago. And so that's what Rust up gives you. Uh, so go and have a look at that, play with that. Now the next thing we wanted to do is look at Cargo. So let's just go and have a look at the online help for Cargo. Cargo dash dash help. So here you can see it's Rust Package Manager. It allows you to again use subcommands to control the behavior of the, the tool. The things, the subcommands that we're gonna look at in particular are new to create a new Cargo package. We're gonna also look at using run when we wanna run our binary. We'll explore build, but we won't call build explicitly. We'll typically just call run because what run will do is if uh, a build hasn't happened since uh, an update to the source code, Rust is, uh, or Cargo rather, is, is smart enough to realize that and it'll run a build before running our, our executable. The other two commands or subcommands that we'll look at later are test and bench. We're not gonna look at that today, but test and bench are really neat because it allows us to build test harnesses, unit tests, and also run benchmarks across our uh, code that we're writing. So, what we're going to do is just get started. Let's build some code. Let's use cargo and the new subcommand to create a brand new package. So if we go and look at cargo new online help, here we have some more information about what we can do with new. The thing that I want to call out here is dash dash bin and dash dash lib. These are two templates that cargo new can use to create sort of scaffolding, if you like. It'll lay down uh, a directory structure and a basic uh, source code sort of outline for you with some uh, some some stubs so that you can get started. The default is is dash dash bin. This is the the binary template or application template, and that's what we're going to be using. We're going to be building a command line tool that can process fits files and do things like display them and what have you. So we're going to we're going to be using dash dash bin, which is the default. If we wanted to build a library, we could and we could pass dash dash lib and it would build a different uh, layout for us. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff in here that I haven't really played with or looked at in much detail. So let's uh, let's do that. So we want to do cargo new. We're not going to need to pass dash dash bin because it's the default, we'll leave it. And then the path, which will be in our case, the name of our package. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll call it fits dash rust because that was, I think the name of the, the GitHub repo just to keep those consistent. Uh, so to do that, cargo new fits, if I can type fits correctly, fits dash rust. So it's created a binary application package for us. If we change into that directory and have a look, we can see there's two things it's created, a cargo toml file and a source directory. The cargo toml file is, think of it as a configuration file used by cargo to manage our package. So let's have a quick look at that. So I'll just cat that on the command line. You can see here it has some metadata about the package, my name and email address, 
It also has a block for dependencies, which is empty. So later on, if we were to use other people's code, uh, we can use uh, other people's packages and crates. In fact, there's a really nice ecosystem of those uh, open source libraries that we can take advantage of, then you could do that here. And every time Cargo goes and builds our package, it would then go and find those dependencies and update them if needed. And so that's a fairly a fairly powerful feature uh, that you would expect in most, most package managers. Let's go and have a look at the source directory. So it's laid down a single file in the source directory called main.rs. So rather than go and look at this in the command line, let's go to Visual Studio Code and we'll open it here and have a look. So I'll open a folder. We'll call it fits, oh, it's fit, fits-rust. And so we'll open that, that folder as, uh, as effectively a new project for us. Okay, and we can see two, we can see our two, two things here. We can see a cargo toml file, uh, which if we open is just what we looked at on the command line. Uh, and then we can also see uh, a source uh, and, and, a, and a target. Well, the target, I think uh, the target was just uh, created when, when Visual Studio Code built our code for us. But anyway, let's go into main.rs and have a quick look at that. So here we can see a very, very simple program that Cargo has built for us. So this is just to get us started. It has a single function, which we can see here called main. It takes no arguments and it returns nothing, at least nothing obvious. Uh, nothing on, you know, it doesn't return anything. Uh, and then there's a single block in that. It's just, that's the function body. Uh, we, we then use something called a macro. This is the print line macro. And it will take a string literal, which currently just says hello world. And it will print that string to stand it out. Right, so it's already done that for us rather than us writing our very first Hello World program in Rust. It's, it's stolen our thunder and done that. But let's go and see if it compiles. It should. The way that we could do that, remember we had a couple of options. We, we could use build, which compiles the current package, or we could do run, which runs a binary uh, or example of the local package. Um, and remember I said if, if uh, we haven't done a build since the last the last run, then it'll go and do that. So let's actually go and do a cargo build manually. We can see here that it's compiled a dev version of our executable. It's unoptimized and it contains a whole bunch of debug symbols or debug info. It was quite slow. It took you know 63 or 630 milliseconds, so uh, over half a second just to compile that that simple file. The Rust compiler is quite slow, uh, and I think it's because it's doing a lot of work. It's, it's quite a clever compiler. There's a lot of things that it catches at compile time that you wouldn't normally do in other languages. In fact, I dug into this a little bit, and there's at least three sort of levels or three phases to uh, compiling a, a Rust executable that I could understand. And the first was after the compiler, after the toolchain builds uh, the abstract syntax tree or the AST, it then builds what's called a high level intermediate representation or, or high level IR. That does, there's several passes that happen there. Uh, I think it does macro expansion and a bunch of other things at that point. Then it generates a medium IR, a medium uh, intermediate uh, representation. Uh, and that medium IR is used to then go and build the LLVM IR, which of course LLVM then uses to go and build uh, the machine code or build the binary that for, for the platform in question. So there's multiple phases to that and then there's a, a whole bunch of work and different passes that happen at, at those different stages or phases as well. So anyway, it's a slow, it's a fairly slow compiler. It's not, I think, optimized for speed like some other languages. Like Go, for example, was a, an explicit design decision was that the compilation should be super fast. Uh, and I think uh, the Rust, as far as I can understand, the Rust team are looking at uh, improving that performance over time. Uh, it's not going to matter for us. We're going to write some really simple code here. We'll probably end up with a few hundred lines of code, Rust code at the end of the day, and so it's not going to really matter for us. Anyway, so we have our built executable. It got uh, it got built for us, and then we could then go and run it. So we could say cargo run. Uh, and so we can see here that it's running our uh, target debug fits-rust.exe file, and all it's done is print out hello world with a new line. Fantastic, which is all we would expect. So uh, it's as simple as that. Let's go back to our code though and maybe make it a little bit more interesting. Let's say, uh, welcome to the fits processing tool written in Rust. Okay, 
we'll save that file. At least it's a little bit more specific to what we want to do. And so rather than doing cargo build explicitly, we'll just do cargo run. It's noticed that we've updated the source code, so it's gone and done a build. Uh, it's, it's written that out to the same the same environment, uh, sorry, the same location, and now it's printing welcome to the FITS processing tool written in Rust. So uh, so that's it for the first session. I think that's uh, for the first, uh, you know, the Rust focused session. I think uh, in the next one, we might cover a little bit more detail on Rust, and then we'll probably go and start understanding the FITS data type or the data format a little bit more. So if this is interesting to you, please subscribe. Uh, be gentle in the comments section. Uh, I'll, I'll caveat this again by saying I'm a complete Rust newbie. I've programmed in other languages throughout my career uh, in different paradigms, functional and object-oriented and you know, more traditional imperative languages and what have you. But I'm completely new to Rust. So hopefully I'll learn it reasonably quickly, but I'll make lots of mistakes. And I'm sure you know, my Rust code won't be idiomatic for a while and, and all those things. So you know, if you're a Rust expert, by all means, please leave constructive feedback. I want this to be a really constructive series where we have a community of people that are learning Rust and they're interested perhaps in astronomy as well. Uh, and so you know, subscribe and, and be, be constructive and tell me what you want to see. Tell me how you want me to improve this. So I hope to see you in the next one and join me for the series. Thanks a lot.